which is all things that most people would do to make a good impression at their job. But I was doing it with the thought in the back of my mind that if I do this, my bosses will like me enough that if somebody's being mean to me or racist to me, they'll have my back. They won't fire me because they don't want to deal with it. Welcome back to the Alberta Worker Podcast. You are tuning in to episode 11 of season one. We are broadcasting from the territory of the Nitsisapi. My name is Kim Siever. I'll be your host today. And I am pleased to announce our guest today, Fatima Saleh, is a stay-at-home parent. Welcome, Fatima. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You betcha. So let's just go straight into it. Tell us about your life. You know, where you were born, where you grew up, what your family life was like, where you went to school. And then as you're telling us that, try to incorporate your personal labor history, your first job, subsequent jobs, and that sort of thing. Sure. I was born right here in Edmonton in 1984. I am one of six children born to two immigrant parents. Uh, My dad came here in 1973 from Lebanon, where he was a refugee. He was born to two refugee parents. They had uh, been forcibly expelled from Palestine in 1948. And so he was born a refugee there, even though he was born in Lebanon. He was never given citizenship in that country. He decided at the age of 25 that he wanted to try something different. So he was uh, given the opportunity to come here. He came here and applied for residency. He was able to slowly but surely bring his entire family over here. So all of his siblings, his parents all ended up making a home here in Canada right here in Edmonton. Sorry, um, just a quick question. You said your dad was born as a refugee, but so he yeah. was born in Lebanon. Yeah, that's right. He, he wasn't able to gain citizenship in no. Lebanon. And then you said he left as a 25 year old. So, so that entire time he spent as a refugee in a refugee camp. So in Lebanon right now, even to this date in 2022, Palestinians are still considered refugees in Lebanon. They don't have access to citizenship in that country. And so when dad was born there, uh, my grandma walked out of Palestine in 1940. 19- We like to tell the story a lot because it's part of our family history that she walked out with a bullet in her shoulder. Oh my goodness. And when she came to this country and every subsequent time that she ever traveled, she had to have documentation on her as to why the metal detectors went off because they were never able to remove that bullet. She Uh never had access to healthcare. And so her cartilage, her skin, everything grew around that bullet. Uh, She was never able to remove it. She carried documentation around with her so that anytime a metal detector went off, she was able to prove what that was. So he was born refugee there. All of his siblings were born. Uh, His entire family, our entire village went to Lebanon. They never were in the camps. There are a lot of refugee camps in Lebanon. They were in the northern region of Palestine in an area called Muqar al-Khayt. So it's near Safad. When they went into Lebanon in the 48 expulsion, mass expulsion, they uh, were given plots of land to live on. And it never became Uh, the camps that you would see what you would call like the slums basically they were able to make little villages so the village that my parents are from in Lebanon is um, kind of I would say mix 70% Lebanese 30% Palestinian it's still quite segregated in the sense that there wasn't a lot of mixing of Lebanese and Palestinian. There's there's separate schools for Palestinian children. There's separate hospitals for Palestinian people. The UN is really involved there. So anyways, he, he came here. He decided he wanted to try for something different and he was able to make it over here. He landed in Quebec. He wanted to come West. He had heard a lot about out West. He had heard that there was people from Lebanon that he knew out here in Edmonton and Calgary. He didn't last um, in Quebec for very long. I think he was there overnight or something. And he came out West and right away started working immediately. My mom's side is scattered all over the world. So they're everywhere. They're in the UAE. They're in Russia, in the States, um, in Lebanon still. So we don't know them that well, but my entire dad's side is here. So we know them quite well. And, is uh, your mom Palestinian too? Yeah, both sides okay. of my family are Palestinian. Yep, my grandparents grew up near each other in Palestine and, uh, you know, had been married only for a few years when they left. And I don't even know if actually if it was years or just one year, because my grandma was pregnant with my dad when she left. So she was five months pregnant. So she got shot while she was pregnant? Yeah, she was five months. Oh so uh, the Nakba happened in May and dad was born in October. So she was about five months pregnant when she walked out. You know, she talks about this long walk that they they made. And we were quite in the northern region of Palestine, uh, our village. And it was a long walk up to, to Lebanon. 
where you know the Lebanese authorities took in all these refugees and they say it's history after that because they were told two weeks you know she left everything there she talks about how she buried all of in like the well she put all of her belongings in there all of her clothing all of her gold everything that they had went in this well and they hid it all because this was only supposed to be temporary they were going to come back to their homes and you know you see that iconic image of the key you know all these older palestinian elders holding onto their key for dear life because they were supposed to go back a lot of them were buried with their keys because not wow. not, not a lot are left you know like dad's 74 this year right and um you know like my city grandma is she's gone and my grandpa died many many years ago now and there's not a lot of elders left and so it's it's really sad that there hasn't been a right of return back to my story you know they sure. they still those stories into us. They told us those stories. So we grew up on those stories. We grew up dreaming of Palestine and dreaming of like looking at all the olive trees. And you go to Lebanon, you go to the south of Lebanon and you can stand where there's this fence, like the border fence. You can see this railway that just cuts off right when you get to the border. There used to be this railway that went through and you can see where it cuts off and you can look right through and see Palestine. So like you're so close and you just see so many Palestinian people at this fence all the time. And they're just trying to put their fingers through the fence to just try to touch that place. Wow. Because you grew up with these stories of like home and like especially refugees in Lebanon it was so close but it was so far and you never felt at home in Lebanon because you were never not a lot of places in the world give you citizenship so there's that you got that that strong sense of you know you want to be home and it's hard if you contrast it to be here even though you know I was born here you're different here too yeah. right yeah. and you know so I don't know we talk about like there's a bit of an identity crisis like, where do I belong? Because if you go to the quote unquote back home, you're not really accepted there as a Palestinian person. And then here you're supposed to be home, but you're not really accepted here either. So it is a bit of an identity crisis. So I think you try to hold on to your, where you are home, which is Palestine, but that's a whole other story. And so anyways, you know, he, he came here in, in 1973, he was 25 and he made a life here. He brought his whole family here slowly. And I have five siblings. Um, I have three sisters and I have two brothers. And we all went to school here. We lived in the West End to begin with. And then my parents used to shuttle us to school in the North Side because Glengarry had this program. There was one class in throughout all the classes that it was a uh, Arabic immersion program. Nowadays, the entire school is like Arabic immersion. But back when I was in school, it was one class had an Arabic program. And so my parents were very excited about that because they wanted us to have language. They wanted us to keep our culture that way. And so they would shuttle us to school to the north side. Once dad had a little bit more work under his belt, he worked as a welder when he first came here. Okay. And uh, once he was able to make a little bit more money to upgrade, his home or you know change houses he moved us all to the north side so we could be closer to the arabic schools and to the masjid the, the mosque that was here in the north side we all went to school um at glengarry it was nice to go to school there because you had people that looked like you and you know you grew up with the language even though it was you know for me when i went to school i went to school with the same set of about 30 kids from kindergarten straight through to grade 12, because all of our parents had the same idea of keeping language and culture. So it really did feel like that small group of people all grew up together. I had my siblings as well. My mom had the first four of us within five years span. So we're all very wow. close in age. Yeah, she was a busy mom. She had, you know, four kids under the age of five at one point. Yeah, my mom was uh, 17 when she had me, just barely 17. And then two years later, she had my sister. And then she and my biological father separated. And then she got together with the person who's now my stepdad. And he had three boys. And so by the time my mom was 21, she had five children, four years old and under. There you go. So you know what it's like to have that uh, that hectic type of lots of kids in the house. And, and, you know, like I mentioned, my dad was bringing over all his siblings. He's the oldest of nine oh, wow. and he was bringing siblings over one by one so you know we had this he had a house and it had two separate suites in it we had a house I should say and every time one of the aunts or uncles would come he would bring them over he would sponsor them they would come live with us okay. and so we grew up in this like culture of community our we were always so close to our family and it was it was a beautiful way to grow up 
I loved yeah. having like so many friends, like cousins that were friends and siblings. And you always had somebody to play with. You always had somebody to be with. And it was, it was nice that way. So we all went to school um, at Glengarry Arabic. And then we went to Killarney. We went to Queenie. It was all with the Arabic program. So we have language and it was nice to be able to have that. It was nice to be able to have that part of our culture instilled in us, even though we were growing up in a place that didn't like that type of thing. You know, mom didn't wear hijab until she was, I think I was like in grade three, if I remember correctly. She had already been in this country for a bit. She, you know, she was living just like everybody else. And then she decided that she was going to put it on. My parents had Ralph's by then. So my parents own a, a convenience store near the Bonnie Dune area. And they have this, what they call Ralph's chicken, iconic chicken in the oh. Edmonton area. Okay. Okay. And, uh, you know, people, a lot of people go there and, you know, they, my parents acquired Ralph's when uh, I was about two years old. So I don't remember not having Ralph's chicken. Strathern is an area that loves us and we love them right back we've been in that area for 35 years now oh wow i remember mom talking about that shift of when she w didn't wear hijab to the day when she did wear hijab and like the questions that would come at her and a lot of the times the questions weren't meant to be mean or rude or racist they were just like weren't even directed at her they would be directed at dad he, they would say things like jim why are you forcing your wife to wear that it's so hot in the kitchen while she's making this chicken you know, you should oh let goodness. him take that off. And like, you know, dad would kind of brush it off and he thought it was funny and he didn't really, like there was nothing called a microaggression back then. Nobody really knew how to label that. I remember, you know, being a little bit older by then because that was really my first job. Even though I wasn't getting paid in money, I was getting paid in candy and Slurpees. Yeah. <laughs> chicken. Yeah. And so I remember hearing that type of stuff because by then I was about eight, nine, 10 years old. I remember, you know, at first... She didn't really reply to them, even though they weren't being uh, directed at her. She didn't really say anything. And then after a while, you could tell it started to bug her. And she would kind of, with the comeback, right? She would be like, she would say something just to kind of show that it really bugged her. Yeah. And I think those comebacks, me watching them and seeing people's reaction and being, you know, people being like, oh, I didn't mean it that way. I didn't mean <laughs> it that, way. that really imparted a lot on me. Like, I think that really shaped the way I viewed the world too, like, it's not okay, you know, for you to put your opinion in some what somebody else is doing, you know, for you to automatically assume it was him that told her to put it on. It wasn't him to, that told her to put it on. He doesn't care what she wears. I remember that quite vividly, that being my first job. And then finally, you know, when I was 15, I graduated to kitchen worker and I finally started getting paid money. <laughs> yeah, it was that was nice of them. Yeah, finally, they were like, okay, you can have a little bit of cash. You know, I remember dad telling us stories of how his customers didn't really understand him as much as they loved us and we loved them. And we were part of that community for so long and we still are, you know, up until it has to close later on this year, or it's going to have to close. The building is getting taken down. Oh. He's talked about, you know, the different conversations he would have with people there. People didn't really, in that area, especially didn't really know what Muslim was. They didn't really know why do people call you Jim, even though it says Ralph's on the sign. And why is your name actually something different that we can't pronounce? And he's like, well, I started letting people call me Jim because Hussein was too difficult to say. All these different things really shaped the way I thought about work. You know, that our parents really instilled in us that model minority, head down, get your job done, provide for your family. And that's the way you're going to survive in this world, especially in a country that is not quote unquote yours. Right. I can't even say it really took a long time to feel like I belonged here because I still kind of don't, especially, you know, with all the different learnings and teachings that you get from Indigenous elders and understanding that we are really settlers here. So maybe we shouldn't feel like we belong here. There's a lot of learning still going on and trying to figure out how to, to be in a place that has the type of history that it has here, especially being Palestinian, who, you know, the word settler is difficult for us. Yeah. Sure. It really is. Absolutely. And to identify as a settler as well is really difficult for somebody like me, because for me, settler is, that's, that's an awful thing. That's the, the person that persecuted my family. Yeah, so you were displaced by settlers and now you are a settler in a different country. And that'd be really complicated. It is. It, is. it goes back to that identity crisis, you know, and like, yeah. What is, what am I supposed to, to think about all this and how am I supposed to navigate through this? And then, you know, my parents, like I said, really, really did subscribe to that model minority, head down, figure it out and just kind of like, don't make trouble. 
you know, and I think they even started to kind of crack that a little bit, especially once mom started to wear hijab because they realized, you know what, you got to be a little bit vocal sometimes. You got to make sure that you let people know that there's nothing scary about this. And this is pre 9-11. And it was still kind of like, it was tight. It was tough for them, you know, to kind of be like, this is okay for you. This is, we're fine. We're still the same people. Just this little thing on my head. I'm the same person I was a week ago. Sure. So, you know, that all of these things were happening right before my eyes and it shaped kind of how I thought and how I felt about things. So I was 15 and I worked there for a couple of years. Right after high school, I went to high school in the North side. They were working out in Bonnie Doon. I had a friend who um, worked at Sears Portrait Studio. She was a manager out there. She's Arab. She's Muslim, I should say. She's Muslim. She's Arab. She uh, didn't wear hijab though. So she wasn't visibly. And she said why don't you come work with me for the summer? You know, like, why don't you come take some pictures? They do, uh, at that time, Sears Portrait Studio was a really big thing. And there would be like the Christmas season, you know? So I started working there in the summer. Christmas season was coming. They would start hiring. Could people back then, it would take like weeks to get your Christmas photos back. So yeah. people were taking Christmas photos like in October or even earlier. Sure. And there would be a rush for them. There was like no cell phone cameras or anything like that. <laughs> but I graduated high school in 2002. There had been a shift in what people thought of people who wore hijab. And I had started wearing hijab when I was quite young. Yeah, so I was- So you were wearing one when you started working at the portrait studio? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. I started wearing one a couple of years, probably. Well, no, not a couple of years. Like I, my mom started wearing it when I was about, I would say eight. And I put, I put it on probably when I was about 12. Okay. I thought that I just wanted to be like her. You know, I wanted to be like all the strong women in my family. And, you know, I wonder if her making the decision to wear it and you were eight. So you remember that point when she was not wearing it. And then all of a sudden now she's wearing it. And I wonder if that had something to do with it as well. Like if you grew up and she was always wearing it, I wonder if it would have had the same impact rather than actually physically seeing her make the choice to start wearing it. Yeah, I think it maybe it did. I never thought of it that way. It probably did. Yeah, it probably did. And also I think, like I said, like watching her kind of stand her ground a lot of the time when people kind of would throw stuff at her. Yeah. She's, she was so empowered. It never got to her. She never crumbled ever. You um, have this, this story of your grandma walking across the border of Lebanon with a bullet in her hand while she's five months pregnant. And now you have your mom, another generation of a really strong example for you. That's really cool. I come from a lot of strong women. There are a lot of strong role models in my family. You know, my sisters after that as well. I have some strong sisters as well. And Palestinian women are strong women. It's nice to be part of that culture to know that, you know, no matter what people say, they can call you oppressed as much as they want, but it doesn't make it true. Yeah. So yeah, yeah starting work at Sears was interesting because it was post 9-11. It was a year after. Oh, right. All of a sudden, it wasn't in a community that knew me. You know, they didn't see me grow up. All of a sudden, it's in a place that really had never had a hijabi working there before. Yeah, and they weren't coming into your parents' store anymore. Right, right. right. And they didn't know me since I was, you know, a kid getting paid in candy. And so it was new because a lot of these people coming in taking their Christmas photos would say outright, can we have another photographer? Because we really need these photos to work. And I think that'll scare my child. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Or they might. Sounds like, sounds like it's scaring the parents. It sounds like they were oh, scared, yeah. oh, not yeah. their children. No, no. Kids are not like that. Kids aren't born racist. You know, kids yeah, would yeah. come and the sweetest kids would come and they would be like, they play with it. And some kids would just like, as if it was a blank, it's the sweetest thing ever. Kids wow. are just, they're not racist. You know what I mean? And yeah. You know, some people would say I'd never met a Muslim before. And that was genuine curiosity. I had never met, a, I've never met a Muslim before. Like you exist outside of my screen. You know, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of families were coming from small towns or, you know, from up North and right. or the most Northern city that they would come and get their photos done. And that was fair. Yeah. Some people would say, I've only seen that on TV or, and then after what, you know, if they would allow me to take their photos after I take those photos, they would say things. And at the time I thought it was such a beautiful sentiment, but later after taking time to unpack it, it would take years to unpack this. They would say things like, you've given me a completely different perspective on people like you. And at first I was like, wow, I'm making change. And I think as I grew, cause I was only 18, as I got older, I realized that that probably was a microaggression. That was probably a really good thing on their part to say to me because first that's putting a lot of pressure on me as an 18 year old another thing is that you just admitted that you know you judge people based on what they look like you're one of the good ones they're telling you yeah, yeah. and that's it's tough it's tough to realize later that you bought into that 
that you were kind of had a feeling of pride about it. And later on, you really feel gross that you thought you felt that way, but it takes, and they're still time. seeing you as an exception. Right. So it's not, you're not necessarily changing their minds. You might be convincing them that there are other people out there who aren't like what they had in their minds, but that doesn't mean they still don't see the majority as being the, you know, the stereotype that they have in their minds. Exactly. And I think to make matters worse is that I didn't do what mom did. I didn't really push back. You know, I was in a place that I was supposed to be the professional. I wasn't supposed to have the quick clap back that right. I might do now. You know, I wasn't, I didn't have the snappy one-liner. Your mom I, was the boss. She had the freedom to be able to, to snap back. She did. Yeah. yeah, she did. And I was just this seasonal worker. And so instead I really bought into that model minority. I'm going to get to work on time and early most of days, and I'm going to make sure I do the best photos pro- possible. And I'm going to make sure I speak in proper, perfect, articulate English, because my English 30 teacher had told me I had an accent. And I said, well, I was born here. How do I have an accent? And she said, you don't pronounce your T's properly. And so I, you know, put it in my head that I would pronounce my T's properly from now on, because this lady figured out I don't have an accent or I have an accent. She Canadians thought, don't pronounce their T's properly. No, she put that in my head. At 17, she put that in my head that I was different, not just for the way I looked, but also for the way I spoke, even though I couldn't detect a different accent than everybody else had. But she said, because of this, you are different. As much as you don't think you are, you're still different, even to the way you speak. My sister Mona laughs at me all the time because of the way I say button. And she's like, how do you pronounce button like that? I'm like, I don't know. She messed me up. (laughs) Yeah, This is what your teacher doesn't realize because she's saying that you're you're not pronouncing your T's properly. Now you're over pronouncing and now you're sticking out because you speak different from everybody else. Yeah, it's been 20 years and I still (laughs) over pronounce my T's. I can't help it. Oh my goodness. And you know, it's such a big learning curve because I was just, I was putting all the effort into my appearance and all the effort into articulating my speech and all the effort into being early and not just on time, which is all things that most people would do to make a good impression at their job. But I was doing it with the thought in the back of my mind that if I do this, my bosses will like me enough that if somebody's being mean to me or racist to me, they'll have my back. They won't fire me because they don't want to deal with it. Other people are doing it so they could be a good worker and you're doing it because you're trying to be a good Muslim. Yeah. And I need to represent. Exactly. I need yeah. them to see that we're not these scary people that they saw in airplanes. And you're 18 and having to deal with that. Yeah, I wrote a thread on Twitter last year about what that day was like for us, even though we were so far away from New York. It was a flip that day. And I had heard racist remarks in my life before that. Of course I did, you know. I had people telling me, go back to where you came from. And I had people saying that, you know, lots of different things. Ever since probably my first racist experience was I was in grade one. Like it goes back that far, but nothing like that. Nothing like September 12th, 2001. That day and every day after that for a while was difficult for us, especially when you wore hijab. It was hard. And so you know, you overcompensated just like I did with overpronouncing my T's. Now I was overcompensating being the best representation I could be. And that's a lot to put on young people that had nothing to do with anything. Absolutely. And it still is. It really still is. And so, you know, I just wanted to succeed and I did, I did well enough that, you know, people were now requesting me by name to do their pictures. I did well in that place. You know, I, I probably overcompensated too much and did too well because instead of just taking a flex year off of school, I quit. I didn't go back to school. I graduated high school with like high honors and I was supposed to go to the university the next year. And I decided, no, I want to be a photographer. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go to school. So I stayed there. I stayed there for a while and it was interesting because it opened up some doors for me. I was there for a couple of years and then I went on my first mat leave. And after I came back from mat leave, it was actually, I was called up a month before my mat leave was supposed to end. And it was the district manager. And she said, would you consider coming back a month early? And I said, for what? And she said, well, we're switching from film to digital and a whole bunch of us are going to go down to St. Louis and we're going to, you know, learn this new digital style of taking photos because we were taking photos with film right. and now we're going to switch all to digital cameras and there's going to be all of this like new styles of editing and a bunch of us from across Canada are going to go and whoever goes will come back to their different districts. And they're going to teach this to all the different workers that are there. And they're going to be training managers. And we would love for you to be one of them. Oh, wow. That was like free trip, 100%. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm going to go. And so I did. But it was the first time I had traveled into the States. 
Oh. And yeah, this was 2004. And I was like, okay, cool. But I never thought it, I was, I think I was just young and I never thought anything of it. I was like, yeah, I'm going to go. Yeah. And I'm with my work family. Like, what am I, what's going to happen? Right. A couple of years before then in 2002, I had made a trip down to Lebanon. Where we live in Lebanon is about a 15 minute drive from the Syrian border. It's like being in Niagara and driving down to Buffalo. It's exactly what it right. is. Right. You just, you make that trip because it's so close and you go shopping. Syria at the time was so cheap. Like Damascus shopping is like, that's what it was like. You would take your money and you would go down to Damascus. You would go shop the souks and you would come back. That's just what everybody did. And we did that. We did that in 2002. And it was on and your passport. It was on my passport. And I never oh. thought of it. Oh. I had never considered that. And so I go down with all my work people and my boss had been flipping through my passport and she didn't say anything, but I saw her kind of stop and look at the stamps. And she said, oh, you went down to Syria before? And I go, yeah, it was amazing. Not even like making a connection. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was so oblivious at that time. She was like, I wonder. And I was like, I was making jokes because already by that time it was established that you were going to get randomly selected. I know I'm going to get randomly selected. She goes, I hope you make the flight time. And I go, why would I make the flight time? She goes, I just, I hope you do. She didn't, she didn't want to worry me, I think. And of course I get pulled aside and I just think they're going to pat down or, you know, do the body scan or do the search, all the things that you're used to as a hijabi by flying at that point. And no, this time they put me in a room oh, and they were oh. like, and yeah, I was interrogated for like two hours and they oh. were like, what is this stamp? And I was like, I went shopping. Like, I swear I went shopping. I did nothing. You know, at that time, you know, you're what, how I was like 20 years old. I was 20. Oh, I had my, I had my first child quite young and I was 20 and I, I had been there once and literally just went shopping. I'm assuming there's nothing on my file, but hours. I was there for hours being interrogated. Wow. Yeah. I ended up going on a separate flight down. Oh yeah. You have to go through this humiliating experience and then you have to go on a plane all by yourself without your cohort. Yeah. And oh. they were, I only knew a few of them from Edmonton. The rest were from across Canada, but I was the only hijabi there. And a lot yeah. of them were like, you came, why you're late? Why? Cause I was introduced to them all late. And they're like, you're late. Why? What happened? And it was, it was awkward. Another thing that happened when I was at Sears actually that I thought was for me, my work experience, I think is quite closely intertwined with my identity because like at one time I was in the camera room taking pictures. I was uh, promoted to assistant manager by this time. So I was taking photos and one of the, the people that worked with me, very quiet, kind woman that was working with me, non-confrontational person completely. And she was a woman of color. She was an Asian girl. She is an Asian girl. I haven't talked to her in years, but she was working at the counter and she was, um, all of a sudden I hear yelling and I'm taking photos of, I think it was a baby or something at the time. And I just said to the mom, like, I just need a minute. I don't know what's going on outside. And I went outside and this man is just screaming at her. And this was again, post 9-11 and passport photos were getting rejected. Like 70% of passport photos were getting rejected because, you know, the Canadian government had changed the way that passports worked and everything was so much more strict at the time. And now passport photos had to be a certain thing. Photographers that were doing passport photos at the time couldn't figure it out. And at one point, a whole bunch of us, like, you know, the different places that took passport photos had to go down to Canada place and get training on how to do these passport photos because the rate of rejection was just so high. Wow. And so anyways, this gentleman comes in and he's speaking in a thick European accent and he's just yelling at her because his passport photo got rejected and he had to go down to Canada place and all the hassle of that. And I interjected because she's in tears. Some man is screaming at her and she doesn't know what to say to him. I said, sir, what is the problem? And he takes his phone and he chucks it at me, <gasps> he takes his keys and he chucks them at me. And I'm like, okay. And he's screaming. And finally, I was like, I got my bearings back and I, I grabbed his phone and his keys. And I said, okay, I now have your phone and your keys. What would you like to do? And he said, you go back to your country, you, and you know, yeah. he went off. And I said, okay, <laughs> sir, you are speaking with the thickest accent I've ever heard in my life. And you're telling me to go back to your country. None of this makes sense. I need you to leave now. And I had to call security. Like, what do you do? Wow. What do you do? Wow. It's just incredible, right? And so that was a lot of the different experiences I had working was just basically wrapped up in my identity, who I was. So after a while, you know, I decided that I was going to work for myself and I was going to choose what I did. Right. And, you know, I didn't want to work for anybody that I couldn't talk about. I didn't want to have to 
work for a corporation. So I decided to freelance and I started doing like wedding photos, family photos. You know, I did some editorial stuff for like different magazines, not in the city because I I could never get hired in the city. I had a friend who was the editor for a magazine in Lebanon. It was called Reg Mag. She lived half the time here, half the time there, but she edited. It was an English publication for in Beirut. And so anytime she had to do anything here, she would get me to do the photos. And actually one time she was doing this piece on this rapper. His name was Gutta Gutta. And I had never heard of him before, but he was on this track called Bedrock with Lil Wayne. And she was like, yeah, it was like a last minute thing. He was in town, she was in town and she had been trying to connect with him. And she was like, well, you come do the photos. I was like, cool. Yeah. This was a learning moment for me and I'm not proud of this, but we go to do these photos and there was a bar across the street from Rexall place. And he was staying in that hotel across the street from there, like the Coliseum hotel, whatever that's called over there. And we were going up the escalator because we were supposed to take these photos. And I was like thinking about lighting and I was like, oh my God, it's going to be such crappy lighting. It's like nighttime. It was like 10 o'clock at night or something. Like how am I going to photos in the shitty hotel room and there's like no flash allowed it was crappy all of it was just this dingy it was gross his name was cash money and he goes what is there to do in this city and I was like nothing not here like you're and I said I was I was young and I said you're in the ghetto there's nothing to do here the minute I said it I realized what I said yeah but language is so ingrained in us and that stuff that we hear is okay to say and it's not After I said that, he goes, I guess I should feel comfortable then. Oh my goodness. And I was like, I just wanted the earth to kind of like split up, swallow me whole and then close back up. Yeah, no kidding. I was like, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it that way. And he grabbed me and he put his arm around me. He goes, I know, but I just want you to learn one thing and know one thing. One person's ghetto is another person's castle. And I learned a really valuable lesson that day. And I told him, I said, you know what? Thank you for teaching me this lesson on that. Like that's something I'll, I'll hold forever. It made me realize that a lot of the language that we think is acceptable isn't. And that language matters and words matter. And I think ever since that day, when a lot of people will say things like, you're too sensitive. You have to be sensitive. You have to really analyze your words because so much of the things that we say even now are racist or ableist and it's not okay. Doing that job in that moment really kind of taught me how to gauge my words and how to be careful about the language I use because language affects people. And it had affected me in so many ways and harmful ways, you know, and I off the cuff said something, I didn't realize how harmful that would be. And he gave me so much grace in that moment. Yeah, and even the language he's using, right, oh. was impactful for you because Absolutely. he could have responded in all sorts of different ways. And that's the way he chose to respond to you. Yeah, I think so. And I think that having that grace, like Mona talks about responding with Rahma a lot of the time, like Rahma means grace, having the wherewithal to have grace. I always argue with her about saying like, there's some people that you have grace with because they're willing to learn, you know, they're willing to apologize. They're willing to sure. say, you know what, I was wrong. But there's some people that don't want to. They're, they're not say, engaging in good faith. Yeah, they're not engaging in good faith is a good way to put it. So yeah, I did that for a while and I stayed freelancing for a little bit until I got pregnant with my third child. And then I took a break from freelancing. And then when she was born, she screamed, she just screamed for like so long, <laughs> just started crying. She was, I thought it was colic at first. So I never went back to work because of that. And a lot of people laugh at me when I say this, but it's true. She screamed for the first three years of her life. She just screamed and nobody knew what was wrong. We thought maybe she was deaf hard of hearing. We finally took her in for a hearing test. If they had to put her to sleep, the nurse came back and the nurse was like, your daughter can hear. She's fine. And I remember bursting out crying. And she's like, why are you crying? That's good news. I go, if she is not hard of hearing, what is wrong with her? Right. Yeah. Like, I don't know what to do because she won't stop crying. And finally, we realized that, you know, with early interventions program and with different doctors and different things, we realized she was autistic. First time, you know, I had never really heard autistic in relation to kids. Like when you, I heard autistic, I thought of like Brain Man or like different, you know, media iterations of autistic. I didn't really know what it meant. And what that meant for a child. I had two kids before that I, you know, I was working when I had my older two. And so mom and Sifty really dealt with them. Honestly, I didn't really 
hang out with them too much. I was young and, you know, our culture, you, you raise kids all together. Everybody helps. And so when, if I was working, my mom was taking care of my kids or my husband, we worked opposite shifts for a while. So I would take care of them at night. He would take care of them in the day. And so when, you know, my third one was born, she would cry all the time. And the only person she would ever be kind of calm or soothed with was me. She wouldn't go near my husband. She wouldn't go near my other kids. She was not happy with anybody but me. And so I didn't go back to work. I stayed with her until uh, she went to a puff program. I was learning more about autism and I was learning it the wrong way. So I was learning about Autism Speaks and I was learning about all these different organizations that you're supposed to do ABA with her and you're supposed to teach her and you're supposed to kind of mask her autism and give her the best chance at a normal life. And I, this is what I was learning because this is the information that the doctors give you and the different people are giving you. You know, a state of awareness was like, I kind of want to know what she's going to be like when she's older. So what's the best place to go to listen to adult autistics? And somebody had mentioned, you know, there's a, there's a whole community of adult autistics on Twitter. Maybe you should go on there and see what, you know, what's what, see if you can get some information there. And I think my world was blown apart because all of a sudden I was reading autistic adults saying that ABA was harmful. Because it's trying to make her normal rather than accommodating her. Well, now I know all of that. Yeah, yeah. At that time, I was like, what? Like I've been doing all of this and it's wrong. And I had to unlearn everything I had learned. It was a lot for me because it was like three years of like delving into all the deep things, but from a textbook neurotypical perspective. Mm-hmm. And now I was unlearning all of it and, and relearning from a disabled autistic perspective. Sure. And I think it was a hard learning curve and I'm still learning. I think everybody continually learns as the, you, know, you never know everything. So now what I've been doing, because I don't work, for money anymore. I do a lot of unpaid labor now. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I do a lot of unpaid labor. I do a lot of house stuff and, you know, with my own kids and my own family, because I've got an almost 18 year old and a 15 year old and a nine year old and a four year old. So we're busy at home. And I've got a lot of families that are dealing with diagnosis for autism because I have two autistic daughters, especially in our community, there's a big stigma. There's a big stigma regarding anything to do with mental health, but especially with invisible disabilities. So I try to be available to people in our community who are not maybe as vocal as myself or my sister are about having kids with disabilities. And so kind of walking them through the diagnosis stage, walking them through the acceptance, walking them through all of the things that they might need to do to either get support or get respite hours or that type of thing. You know, sometimes it takes some tough love. Like I've been known to um, yell at some of the ladies in the community or some of the men in the community and just kind of like give them some tough love about, you know, when they're getting diagnosis for their kids so I do a lot of that so it feels like a lot of support work right yeah I'm on the phone a lot with families like not just the unpaid labor with your own children and your own household but with other people you know as well mm-hmm. yeah yeah you know you talk about culturally sensitive supports and there's no culturally sensitive supports within our framework either within the city or within the gov- within the province it doesn't feel like to me not that I've been able to access at least for therapies for different things that happen like like if I need a therapy for anything to do with trauma that happens in my life it's difficult to access culturally appropriate supports for that I've heard countless times uh people that I know that will say I can't go talk to a therapist because they're not going to understand from a cultural perspective what this means to me and it's getting you know, to a point where there are people from our community that are therapists, there are people that are from our community that would be able to provide that support. But it's a it's a difficult circle that's or cycle that's happening because we are the model minority, you know, we try to be and so a lot of our kids are pushed into be a doctor, a medical doctor, be an engineer, yeah. you know, be a lawyer, we need more different types of job workers to have culturally sensitive supports, right? Yeah, well, three of our children are have been in therapy. All three of them are part of the queer community. And so we've had to actively look for therapists who have experience in that field. You can't just pick any therapist, right? Because you need to be able to at least have the perspective or the understanding of where they're coming from, whether it's regarding trauma or whether it's regarding how you're interacting with the experiences you have every day or whatever else. So yeah, yeah, it's totally... 
totally get it. I mean, it's not the same thing, but there is some parallels there. It is kind of the same thing, I think, because, you know, if your child as a queer person is going to a therapist that, you know, is evangelical, you know, and yeah. that person yeah. doesn't subscribe to that thought or doesn't, doesn't think that is it's not going to work, you know, because they're going to have that preconceived notion and it doesn't work. So if my child as a Muslim child with autism needs culturally sensitive support, but they're going to go to um, somebody that believes bad things about Muslims, that doesn't work, you know, or automatically sees that my child's mom is a hijabi and doesn't like hijabis, that's not going to work. Sure. So, you know, they're, they're, these things need to be taken into account. Yeah. And so here you are. Yeah. So yeah. you have three children? I have four. Oh, four children. Okay. And so the daughter with autism, is she your youngest? I have two daughters with autism. So one is nine. Oh. Yeah, one is nine. She's verbal. Okay. She was the one that I think I made mistakes with a lot because uh -huh. I kind of was just, I didn't know enough. So there was a lot of anxiety. There was a lot of stress there. A lot of that kind of fed into her because I was just ready to rip my hijab off. My younger one came four years later. She was born into a family that was really structured already for autism. Mm -hmm. We had already been through all that. We had already been through the growing pains. Right. You know, so we already were a routine based family. You know, we already had all that infrastructure, I guess you could say, set up. So she was already into that. We I already knew what to do if, you know, XYZ happened. So she didn't have to deal with those growing pains. And so even though she's nonverbal and I did have new challenges with her and I call them challenges because it is challenging to teach your child how to use an AAC device. So like an iPad to speak. Yeah, yeah. I'm learning something new with that. It is challenging to figure out like with my nine-year-old, she didn't potty train till she was much older. Like she was probably four and a half when she potty trained, but it was like flipping a switch. One day she wasn't potty trained. The next day she was because she decided she was going to go to the bathroom now. Oh, okay. But with my five-year-old now, it's taken a longer time for her because she has different sensory needs. And she has, you know, I'm learning now. I didn't learn this with my nine-year-old, but I'm learning now about something called interoception. It's a different sense in the body. You know, you talk about sight, smell, hearing, taste. There's a different sense that you have that's called interoception. So the feelings that you have inside your body, what is the trigger that allows you to know that you need to go to the bathroom? And how in tune are you with that trigger? Right. And so it's all these things that I'm learning about. And then in turn, I can take that knowledge. And if somebody from the community or anybody outside the community comes and says, my child is six years old and is not potty trained, I can say, hey, I know this, 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 this. Here's the resources that you can go find and access. So you didn't talk about your mom too much. One thing you said was that her family is spread all over the place. Like, Where did she and your dad meet? Here in Canada? No, my parents grew up together in Lebanon. Oh, they right. Were, yeah, yeah. You were really close. Your grandparents lived close to it. So they knew each other. Yeah. Did they get married in Lebanon? Yeah. Okay. So they were yeah. married before they came over. My dad came here and then in 72, and then he went back to visit his family. I don't know how long he was here. Actually, that's a good question. For the, I don't know how long he was here before they got married. It must okay. have been, if I, if I add my, my, sis, my oldest sister's age, he was probably here for seven years. Oh, wow. Okay. No less. Maybe five years and then he went back for a first visit and he must have seen her then again for the first time okay so they weren't yeah. together or anything prior to that no no okay no right. but they were from right. the same village yeah 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 and and all of you were born in canada yeah so they got married and then went back like he came back for a visit they got married and then they went back together and then all of you were born here in canada yeah, exactly. okay cool how did you meet your spouse? My parents would take me back home every two years. They would take all of us back home every two years so we could maintain that language and that culture. He, uh, he's from there? Yeah, he's from there. From Lebanon or from Palestine? Well, he's Palestinian refugee from Lebanon. Oh, also. Oh, wow. Okay. So yeah. you have lots of things you can share in common and stuff. So, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So I've been going to Lebanon to go visit ever since I was, I think the first time I went, I was nine months old. And then my parents would take us down every two years to see their, my mom's family. So my grandma was, my mom's mom uh, lived and died in Lebanon. Okay. My dad would go visit his family as he was bringing them over. So my grandma didn't, my grandma on my dad's side didn't come until I think I must have been around 10. Until she came, we would go visit her as well. And um, was he from the same village that you, yeah. your parents grew up? Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. So like the entire village that was ethnically cleansed from Palestine all came over together and then settled in that one place. 
Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. There's something similar to that here in Lethbridge too. A few years ago, Canada was resettling some Bhutanese refugees, brought a whole bunch into Canada. And Lethbridge was one of the places that ended up getting some of the refugees. And then for some reason, I'm not sure exactly why, but the ones who settled here started to reach out to some of the other refugees that had been settled elsewhere in Canada. And then we're convincing them to come here. And now Lethbridge has like the highest concentration of Bhutanese people in the country. And so you have all these people from this one area of the world all of a sudden settling into this one community. So it's, it's kind of neat. We even have like a handful of Bhutanese businesses, like uh, restaurants and, and markets and things like that. That makes so. a lot of sense to me. That's kind of like when dad first came, like he didn't yeah. want to be alone in Quebec. He right. knew that the people from the same heritage out in Edmonton and Calgary, and that's mm -hmm. what out to Edmonton and Calgary, that sense of community, because, you know, where we're from, community is everything, which it is for a lot of different people, but like, it takes a village, you know, sure. and wanna, you know, he wanted to maintain culture for us, and he wanted to really maintain language for us. And you need more than just your nuclear family to do that. You need to be able to have established schools and to be able to establish places of worship and so you know we went to school and we had we ha we were lucky enough to be able to go through a program that I was able to have Arabic language for 12 years as did all my siblings and all my cousins and I can read Arabic I can't really write it great you know and even though I went to school for that long and having Arabic if I didn't have any of that I would have lost that language yeah my mom's first language is French and mm -hmm. we didn't get taught it when I was growing up. Yeah. And so uh, that's something that I really wish could have been different with the way that I was raised. My mom just speaking French to me and just growing up and learning it. I was able to learn it in school and I took it as a minor in university. So I'm okay with it, but my written French isn't that great either. <laughs> Yeah, great. So that's pretty much your life story. That's awesome. That's super cool. I, I was enthralled the entire time you were sharing your experiences with me. I think you've already touched on this, but something I always ask my guests is how has your intersections of marginalization ever influenced your experiences as a worker? So the way that our society marginalizes you, it could be gender or religion or ethnicity or disability or whatever else. How has your intersections of marginalization ever influenced your experiences as a worker? And I think you've already touched on that, but maybe there might be some others that you'd be willing to share? Yeah, there was a time that I was working with Sears. Like Sears is gone now, so I feel like I can say this without any ramifications. <laughs> um, there was a time I was working at Sears. Like I said, my boss there was Arab. She was also Palestinian. And I never wore um, a necklace that had the Palestinian flag on it because I just didn't have one. I never wore it. And so uh -huh. she had a Palestinian flag necklace. And our boss not our district manager but like the canada-wide manager so like the ceo of the company like and it wasn't sears canada it was a company called cpi which i think still operates out of like walmart portrait studios right oh, if I'm taken. so it was a portrait studio company and he i believe had some ties to either israel or something oh and so she was, uh, and he was, he was a very, like, he was amazing. He had never, ever made any comments about anything, but a customer came in one time and saw her necklace and did not like her necklace and wrote a letter oh and goodness. sent this letter up the chain of command. I remember that because of who the CEO was, this letter got up pretty quickly and they were going to, you know, and she had been a, like a loyal worker there and she was there for years and years and years. And she made, you know, there, you always had to hit these quotas. You had to make sales quotas and whatever. She was quite a good worker there. She always hit her quotas. She always did such good work for them. But watching her go through this process of like how her self-expression was being taken away, they said she wasn't allowed to wear the necklace anymore. And she was upsetting some of the customers with her, you know, this was too political and this was too this and too that. I think that was part of me deciding to go freelance too. So on right. top of like, I didn't want, I wanted to be able to say what I wanted to say and, you know, talk about what I wanted to talk about, you know, and not have to deal with the racism and not being being able to talk back to people, it was difficult to watch somebody with the same identity as me. She's Palestinian. And, you know, the customer is always right. And that customer did not want her to have that freedom of expression. And they took it right up to the CEO. And I don't think it mattered who he was. I think anybody at that point would have been like, take that necklace off. Yeah. Yeah. So that was difficult. And at that point, I was like, yeah, I'm done with this. Yeah. Because I mean, how, how much longer would it have 
taking for them to come at you about wearing a hijab, right? Yeah, I don't know. They, you know, it was an interesting dynamic there because you're there taking pictures of other people. And so it shouldn't matter what you look like. You're not in front of the camera. Right. And yeah. even if you were, it shouldn't matter what you look like. But it was such a volatile time being that it was in the early 2000s. Any hijabi was just under the microscope. Yeah. And being in this place where you're supposed to be smiling all the time. And you have to smile because you got to get other people to smile. Sure. I remember yeah. my first day working there, like my cheeks hurt by the end of the day. <laughs> I was smiling so much. You had to just smile all the time. And now in pictures, I don't usually smile in pictures because I think I just... I was so sick of smiling. I just didn't want to smile anymore. So now in pictures, I'm pretty like, I don't smile very often in pictures because I I did that for so long. Yeah, no kidding. Any final thoughts for our listeners? No, not really. I think that my takeaway is probably to remember that words matter. I think that was my biggest takeaway from my own work experience working out and being out in the workforce is that taking ownership for your words. Yeah. Well, that's sure. it yeah different identities and different things and i don't know what else to really say about that oh that's fine you said a lot so <laughs> i think you've had a lot of messages uh, and insights to share with the listeners so that's great um where can people follow you and your work if they're interested to read more about the things you have to say in social media or if you have a website or anything like that yeah i'm not really on social media except on twitter all my other accounts are private because i share photos of my children there sure um yeah but i'm on twitter and it's Fatima Sal, F-A-T-I-M-A-S-A-L-8-2. And yeah, that's the only place I really am on there. Usually sure. you'll find me on there pretty much clapping back at somebody who said something. <laughs> like, sure. you know, or, you know, making fun of my sisters because that's <laughs> fun to do too. Yeah. And I'll be sure to include the username in the episode description. Cool. Well, if people are interested in following the Alberta Worker, you can find us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. You can also visit our website at albertaworker.ca. When you're there, you can sign up for our daily, monthly, or even weekly newsletter, where you'll be able to find out our latest news articles that we've written. If you like this episode or the podcast in general, please rate this and write a review for us. If you'd like to support the Alberta Worker, please visit albertaworker.ca ca slash support the alberta worker podcast is made possible from donations from visitors like you if you're interested in being a guest on the alberta worker please email us at podcast alberta thank you very much fatima for joining us today thank you to all the listeners for joining us as well and as always solidarity thank you for having me.